Someone once said that you can live for four minutes without air. You can live for four days without water. You can live for 40 days without food. But you can't live one second without hope. Isn't that true? You can't live one second without hope. We all need hope to continue to move forward in life. So today, I want to start a series that's going to last for three months through 1 Peter. And I'm doing it intentionally because we're living in crazy times right now, especially in our nation where I've never seen quite the election frenzy like we're experiencing right now. And I want us to look at a book of the Bible that addresses a group of people called Christ followers living in a place of great malignment and maliciousness, yet called to hope. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 12 are our verses this morning. Out of reverence for the reading of the scripture, if you're able, would you now please stand? This is the word of the Lord, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. Hear his heart of hope from God's word. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles, elect exiles, of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ for the sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope, born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning the salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven Things into which angels long to look. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. So let's jump in. First Peter, one of my favorite books in all the New Testament. Who's the author? Who's the author of First Peter? Oh, you're brilliant, aren't you? Yes, Peter is, of course, the author of First Peter and Second Peter. Uh, Peter was one of the apostolic members. Uh, He was probably the spokesperson of the 12. Uh, He was a part of the inner circle, Peter, James, and John, who spent intimate times with Jesus like no other. Uh, Interestingly, in Luke 22, during the Last Supper, the night before Jesus died on the cross, Jesus looks at Peter and says, Peter, Satan has asked permission to sift you like wheat. I've often asked the Lord not to let Satan sift me like wheat, but he has sometimes. And it's interesting, Jesus said, and I've granted it. Notice that Satan, the evil one, the enemy of your soul, is a creature. He's not the creator. God's the creator. Satan's on a leash. He can only do what Jesus permits him to do in your life. But then Jesus says to Peter, though, after you've gone through the trial... 
You're going to be restored, and then you're going to strengthen your brother's and sister's faith. So Peter ends up denying Jesus within 24 hours, not once, not twice, but three times. He feels like a total failure, but then in one of Jesus' resurrection appearances, he renews his commitment and love to Peter and forgives him not once, not twice, but three times. God's grace is always greater than all of our sin. And what we have in First and Second Peter is Peter strengthening our faith. He's doing the very thing through these letters that Jesus said he would do. So that's the author. The audience are the elect exiles. Who are they? They are Gentile and Jewish Christians living in a very decadent, pagan, godless Roman Empire. They are elect of God. We'll look at that in just a moment. But they're in exile. They're in the Roman Empire, but continually being maligned, marginalized, and persecuted because of their faith. And I am convinced that's going to happen more and more with committed Christians in our culture. I mean, just the biblical belief in sexual ethics is going to continue to marginalize Christians against the culture. Expect it. So Peter is writing this letter as a note of hope to people who follow Jesus living in the Roman Empire that is continually persecuting them because of their love for Jesus. And then Peter says in these opening verses that what he's calling people to do is to have hope because they've been born again to a living hope through the resurrection. Now, let's unpack that. A living hope. What's the opposite of a living hope? A dead hope. Dead hope is an oxymoron. It's like jumbo shrimp. Doesn't exist, okay? There's no such thing as a dead hope. There's only one option, a living hope. And we're born again to that living hope. How someone born again? By the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Any of you who've hung around any numbers of weeks or months or years here know that the gospel of Jesus Christ is my passion. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus. It's the power of God unto salvation, first for the Jew, then to the Greek, Romans 1.16. By the preaching of the gospel, people's dead, stony, selfish hearts are birthed again into an alive heart that wants to follow Jesus. But what's the gospel? The word means good news. But you can't understand the good news unless you first understand the bad news. And the bad news is very bad. The bad news is we are at enmity with God. Even at the moment of conception, it begins. We have rebelled against God, have become traitors against his divine will and kingdom. We have done life on our own terms. We've shaken our fist against his will and rebelled against him. Our trajectory should be eternal death, eternal separation from God. We should spend eternity in hell. That's the bad news. The good news is, though, that God so loves us that he became one of us through Jesus. He lived the perfect life we could not live. He went and died on a cross, shedding his blood, the sprinkling of his blood that Peter talks about here in these verses. And his blood was shed instead of ours. We should have been under a capital death sentence from God because of our rebellion. We should have had to shed our blood and be eternally separated from God. But God so loved us, he took the death penalty upon himself. Jesus died for our sins, something he didn't deserve, and then gives us the gift of eternal life, the salvation from our sins, something we don't deserve. All by grace, through faith, not of our works. There's nothing meritorious within us that God finds pleasing at all. But then when we receive Jesus, we have the righteousness of Christ. When God looks at us, he does not see our muck or our junk. He sees the very perfection of Jesus. That's the good news. That's the gospel. And when it's rightly proclaimed, In a powerful way, people's dead, stony hearts are born again. They're birthed to new life. Jesus said to Nicodemus in John 3, 3, unless you're born again, you can't inherit the kingdom of God. You must be born again. It's not an option. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have to be born again. People ask me, how do I know if I'm born again? Well, how do you know you've been born? Are you breathing? I hope so. Are you moving? I hope so. Those are evidences of your first birth. Well, there are evidences of the new spiritual birth, a desire for prayer, a love of God's word, a desire to serve others, 
a desire to give him all the glory and everything in your life, a crucifixion of all selfishness and pride, living in humility, all of those are evidences of being born again. And you must be born of the Spirit. The humble Jesus living inside of you and conforming you to his image, making you more and more like him. And that's done through the power of the resurrection by the preaching of the gospel that lives in your heart. Romans 8, 11 says that the power that raised Jesus from the dead for those of us who believe now lives in us. Think about that. The very power that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside those who believe. They've been born again. And it produces then a living hope. It believes that the God who's outside of history, who sees everything in history, is one step ahead of what we know today and is working everything, everything together for his good. God wants to create hope in all of our hearts. In those of you who come today hopeless and despairing, God wants to give you a living hope to continue to face tomorrow. Now, how does Peter then unfold that living hope? He says you need to focus on the right doctrines of the faith. He gives us several here in these verses that we need to know about to create hope. God wants to give you hope today. Turn to your neighbor right now and say, God wants to give you hope today. Do so right now. Turn to your neighbor and say, God wants to give you hope today. God wants to give you hope today. God wants to give you hope today. And you get hope by believing in right doctrines of the faith. Well, here's the first one that Peter outlines. It is the doctrine of foreknowledge. Uh, What's foreknowledge? It simply means that God knew you by name before you ever knew him. In fact, the Bible says that from the foundations of the world, even before the world was ever created, he foreknew you by name. You're not an accident. You're not a surprise. You weren't created by primordial sludge. You are known by God by name before the world was ever created. And if you truly believe that, how many believe that today? That should give your heart hope. No matter what you're facing, the God who knew you before the world was ever created knows you now as you're facing your future. And he's giving you hope today that he loves you, knows you by name, and is in control of your life. Then second doctrine is the doctrine of election. These Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians were elect exiles. Now, the doctrine of election that God elected us and chose us always has people asking me, well, what about us choosing God? Isn't that in the Bible as well? It is. John 7, 39, for example, whosoever will choose me. I mean, that's there too. Well, how do you know you're one of the elect? Well, choose God. Choose God. If you choose God, you're one of the chosen, obviously. But here's what you need to know. Before you ever chose God, God chose you. Before you ever contemplated making a decision to follow Jesus, he had already made a decision for you to follow him. It's a mystery. I don't understand it. But let me tell you something. If you believe it, it should crank you to believe even more in Jesus. It should increase hope in your heart. Why? Because if he foreknew you and elected you before the foundations of the earth, that means he loves you and has everything in your life in his oversight. Everything. And on those days when you feel unworthy and you feel unloved, when you feel like you've screwed everything up and God couldn't possibly love you, what do you do? You go back to the doctrines of foreknowledge and election and say, but he's the one who knew my name before I ever knew him. He's the one who chose me before I ever chose him. Then it's all about God and not you and your mess. Let me give you an illustration. Most of you know I had the privilege of playing basketball at the University of North Carolina under Dean Smith. And I don't get it to this day why Coach Smith recruited me. I mean, when I was in high school, I was a good high school player, but I mean, I was so skinny. When I turned sideways and stuck out my tongue, I looked like a zipper. I mean, I, mean, I had to run around the shower to get wet. You know, you know, when I took a shower, I had to put the plug in the drain so I wouldn't go down the drain with the water. I mean, that's how skinny I was. I heard every skinny joke imaginable from everybody. Hey, bird chest, how you doing? Okay, got it. I didn't understand that Coach Smith saw something in me. And so one day, I got a letter from Dean Smith saying he'd heard about me and knew me by name. You see? But before I ever knew Coach Smith... He knew me. 
And then he started recruiting me. Came down to Florida and spent some time with my family and ultimately offered me, Bird Chess Chadwick, a four-year scholarship to play basketball at North Carolina. Now, before I ever chose North Carolina, Dean Smith had decided that he had chosen me. There are days, honestly, that I look at some of the names of people who played at North Carolina. <laughs> Larry Miller, Charlie Scott, I'm going way back, guys. Phil Ford, Michael Jordan, Eric Montross, more recently Tyler Hansbrook. And amidst the names on all those lists of lettermen that played at North Carolina is a scrawny kid out of Orlando, Florida named David Chadwick. And there are days I go, <laughs> why am I on that list? I don't deserve to be on that list. I'm not good enough to be on that list. I'm not worthy enough to be on that list. And right when those moments crash into my brain, I hear a voice that reminds me, it doesn't matter what you think. The only person's opinion that matters is Dean Smith's. His is the only opinion that matters. And he knew your name before you did. And he chose you to be on his team, not you. So therefore, you should have a great hope in your heart because he's the one that initiated the relationship. On those days you feel unworthy, like a total scumbag, you've messed up everything, remember the doctrines of foreknowledge and election. God knew your name and he chose you before the foundations of the world. And that should give your heart what, folks? Hope. A little louder, please. That should give your heart. I want you to talk back at me some today, okay? That should give your hearts what? Hope. It should make you realize that the God of yesterday who knows you today has your future secure in him. The next doctrine is the doctrine of salvation by his blood, verses 2 and 5. Salvation. You know, in the South we live with people going all the time, hey, brother, are you saved? Hey, sister, are you saved? You ever thought about what you're saved from? Have you ever thought about that? We always tend to think we're saved to go to heaven. We're saved from hell. That should create such a sense of thanksgiving in your heart, you can't even begin to express it. He entered this world to save me from eternal separation from the Father. Wow. By his blood, should have been my blood shed, he saved me. Now, here's the deal. If God saved you once, he'll what? Save you again. If he did it once, he can do it again. So no matter what you're facing in life, if you believe in the doctrine of salvation by his blood and that God cares for you that much, you should have what? Hope in your hearts. The next doctrine is the doctrine of sanctification. That's a fancy one in verse 3. What does that mean? It means the process of becoming holier. Philippians 1.6 says that the one who began the good work in you will be faithful to complete it. How do you become sanctified or holier? Peter says by obedience to the moral law of God. As you live in the crazy, decadent, godless culture in which you live, you totally make decisions every day to follow Jesus. You obey. And then what happens is you're not as bad as you were the day before. You're not as good as you'll be tomorrow. But you live confidently that the one who began the good work, who gave you your new birth in Christ, that he will be faithful to complete it. And on your deathbed, when you die, or in the second coming of Jesus, he will complete the work of conforming you perfectly to the image of Jesus. And if you truly believe that, that God will one day make me perfect, that should give your heart what? Hope for today. The next doctrine is the doctrine of the inheritance of the saints in verses 4, 8, and 9. What does that mean? It means that the promises that God has given to us about heaven will happen. Our bodies will be made whole. We will have eternal life with God in heaven. There will be a place that has no disease, turmoil, trials, or difficulties. That place is promised to us. In fact, Peter says that we're kept for that particular place. We are guarded for that last time. I love that word kept. You know, in a bad way, some men say, I got a kept woman. Well, what does that mean? He's hidden her, but she's secure anytime he needs her. I have kept my money in a safe that nobody knows where it is. That means that money is secure. Well, God has kept you as one of his saints, as a perfect vessel, guaranteed heaven one day. And that heaven is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, Peter says. It's perfect in every way, and it's guaranteed you. 
if God's the one who initiated the gift of salvation, you can't give it back to him. And if you truly believe the security of your eternal salvation, that should give you what today? Hope. It should give you hope today. And then there is the doctrine of the second coming in verse 5, to be revealed at the last time. Remember, God stands over history. He created history. He's not in history. He's not worried about what's going to happen in the next moment. God's not in heaven biting his celestial eternal fangle nails, nails going, oh no, who's going to be elected president of the United States? <laughs> Folks, I do not have a federalistic Christian faith. What does that mean? My faith is not in the president of the United States. My faith is in the God who sits on the throne of all the heavens, who oversees the United States and all nations. I don't have a federalistic view of my Christian faith. I have a faith in God who oversees everything. So this God who oversees everything, who knows what's going to happen next, who sees the beginning and the end, he knows the end's going to happen. There's a day when he wins, will send Jesus again, and this world will be made complete. That means that all those people who've hurt you, they don't get away with it. All those mass murderers, they don't get away with it. All those injustices in the world, they don't get away with it. One day God will come back and make all things right and perfect justice will rule in his world that he created. Now, if that's true and you believe that Jesus is coming back and will make all things right one day, that should give your heart huge what? Hope. And then there's the doctrine of the Holy Scripture in verses 11 and 12. I love this. I love this. Peter says, the Old Testament prophets prophesied and looked forward to the day of the cross of Christ. They looked forward to the day of the gospel being preached. Now, Peter says the Holy Spirit was the one who inspired them to write their words and to look forward to the future. Did you know there are 125 different prophecies in the Old Testament that are fulfilled in specificity in the New Testament? 125. Now, if you just take eight of those and you look at the probability factor of eight prophecies out of 125 being fulfilled in specificity in the New Testament, the odds of that happening are 10 to the 17th power. Or more specifically, it's one with 17 zeros after it. And you doubt the authority of the Old Testament? You doubt it's God breathed and the Holy Spirit himself didn't write through those prophets those words? And then you ask, well, what about the New Testament? I'm so glad you asked. Thank you so much. The opening part of these verses, Peter says, I, Peter, an apostle. What does that mean? It means he's one of the twelve. And Peter told those, I mean, excuse me, Jesus told those apostles, when you go out into the world, when you speak and when you write, you're speaking and writing my very words. Now, if Jesus is God, which is what he claimed, that means that when they spoke and wrote, they're speaking the word of God. So, the Gospels, Matthew, one of the twelve. Mark gave the words of Peter. Luke gave the words of Paul. John, one of the apostles. Those gospel accounts were written by apostles, so therefore they're very words of Jesus himself. And when they wrote letters to the churches, which is basically Romans through Revelation, they were correcting wrong doctrine and giving right behavior for people who were followers of Jesus, First and Second Peter being two of those letters. And when they wrote, they clearly understood it. That's why they would say, I, Paul, an apostle. I, John, an apostle. I, Peter, an apostle. They knew they were clearly stating to people, these words I'm writing to you are the words of Jesus himself. And if they're the words of Jesus himself, they're the words of God himself. That means that the Old and New Testaments are the word of God. God breathed, God inspired, and you don't have the privilege of saying, that book's not true. But if you do believe that book, and all of its 7,464 promises, and all that it teaches and gives you about your life now and your future, you should have what? Great hope as you read this book and you believe it's true. I'm overcome today with the amount of biblical illiteracy in the church today. Folks, that's your fault. You've got to make choices to read know, understand, and obey this book. This is what will set you apart from others who even call themselves believers in Christ. And this will cause you to be a little bit of an ex elect exile. 
but it's true. The doctrine of the scripture, though, should give you hope in your future. Now, the evidence of that hope, according to Peter, is inexpressible joy. I love that term that Peter used, inexpressible joy. There's no words to describe the kind of joy that we should know in Christ. It's just not indescribable. Just unbelievable. It should ruminate and edify and be evident to everybody out there of the Christ who lives in us. An inexpressible joy. <laughs> Robbie Fisher has been on staff with me for uh, 25 years. We've become great friends. He's an associate pastor on the Ballantine campus. And, and Robbie is one of those strange breeds. He is an absolutely devoted Chicago Cubs baseball fan. Oh, a few of you are out there, huh? Well, if you know anything about Chicago Cubs baseball, they're terrible. And they've been terrible since the onset of baseball. They've not won anything, and they have a billy goat chokehold around their necks, except it seems to be different this year. They are the major league's most winning baseball team, and Robbie is delighting in the moment. He wears Chicago Cubs attire all the time to staff meetings or whatever. So, just to let people see the joy about the Chicago Cubs that exists in Robbie's heart, I love to ask him in staff meetings, Robbie, how about them Cubbies? And his face lights up with inexpressible joy. In fact, Robbie and Janet just celebrated their 30th wedding anniversary. So where does Robbie take Janet to celebrate his 30th wedding anniversary? You guessed it, Chicago and Wrigley Field to watch his beloved Cubbies. Well, Robbie sends me a picture of him and Janet at one of the games. They win in extra innings on a walk-off hit, and Robbie sends me this picture of him and Janet. <laughs> Folks, that is inexpressible joy. It's inexpressible joy. Isn't that a great picture? You can't describe it. But let me tell you something. That expression should be on every one of our faces who follow Jesus. Everyone, why? Because we've won. We've won the victory. Our Lord who lives in us has conquered the power of sin and death. He has given us the victory. We've won. Celebrate that right now, would you please? We've won. We've won. And that victory that we know in Jesus should fill our hearts with hope. Hope. Because he won. And the God who oversees all of history is working all things together for victory. He promised it. Peter says, though, though you've not seen Jesus, yet you still believe in him. That's the key to inexpressible joy, too. In the 20th chapter of John, Thomas, one of the disciples, wasn't with the other disciples in one of Jesus' resurrection appearances. Jesus did appear later on, and Thomas had said in between, you know, unless I touch the wounds in his hand and on his side, I'll not believe. Jesus appears to him and shows him the wounds. There's no evidence he actually touched them, but he showed him the wounds. And Thomas falls to his knees and cries out, my Lord and my God, and worships Jesus. And then Jesus says something very powerful. He says, Thomas, you've seen and believed, but blessed are those who have not seen, yet still believe. How many of you want to be blessed by God? How many of you want a supernatural touch of God? All of us do. Then continue to believe, though you've not seen. Blessed are those who continue to believe but have not seen. I need to give you this warning. Even though there's great joy and hope in our lives as followers of Jesus, Peter gives us a warning. There will be various trials. Drat. I looked up the word various in the dictionary this week. Guess what it means? Various. All different kinds of ones. There are physical trials. There are relational trials. There are vocational trials. There are all kinds of them. And just when you think you're getting out of one, it seems like another comes your way, doesn't it? There are various trials. And Peter says that in these various trials, God's doing something. The God who sits over all history, he sees what's going to happen next to you. And what he's doing in these various trials, if you'll continue to believe, he's refining your faith 
like gold. When you drop gold into fire, it removes all the dross and impurities. The various trials God uses to burn off all of those places that are impure before him. That God's much more concerned with you having a golden faith than he is a golden life. And if you really believe he's working all things together for good and his victory, you have hope. Let me give you a personal illustration. just happened recently. A little over a year ago, our our Michael, our youngest son, was enjoying swimming. He was a good college swimmer. Um, He was having some sense of accomplishment. And then last year in July at a meet down in Athens, Georgia, I couldn't go. Marilyn went and she texted me and said, "Uh, your youngest son in the 100 free just put up the fastest time in the world this year. What? Little guy graduated from high school, 6'5", 150 pounds. Takes after his dad, doesn't he? Okay. I was so proud. But suddenly, our son, who had gotten some notoriety with swimming, but not a whole lot, is thrust into the international spotlight. And there's a lot of chatter going around that Michael Chadwick could make the Olympic team and go to Rio. And he worked so hard last year. He disciplined himself, tried to get in the best possible shape. At the end of the year, with all the other American times, he was in the top six times, and that was great news because... With the Olympic team in the 100 free, you can make a relay, the top six get on the team. and all the other events, only the top two get on the team. So he had a chance, a real chance. So we got to Omaha, and what happens is all the hundreds swim in the events, and with the 100 free, for example, you try to go to the top 16, which was a piece of cake for Michael, supposedly, then go to the top eight, and then you swim off the top eight, and all you got to do is beat two people, and you're on the team. So Michael swims in the first large group to get to 16. He dives into the water. Never happened to him before in thousands of dives. But the force of his hands hit the water and somehow his left arm was pulled back behind him. He veered off to the left, almost had a DQ getting in the lane next to him. But he suddenly swam a furious race and tried to catch up. But at the end of the event... He was 18th. Couldn't catch up. Well, just so you can know a little bit of the story, Ryan Lochte, who Michael knows, swam with him at Swim Mac. They became really close friends. Ryan Lochte finished 11th, and he went to the coaches and said, I'll give my spot so Michael Chadwick can swim. So when you read all the stuff about Ryan Lochte, remember that too. But that makes Michael 17th. He still needs one more. And they went to a few others and asked them if they'd be willing to give up their spot, knowing that that wasn't their event, they weren't going to make the team, and nobody would do it. Michael finished 17th. All of his hard work, all that he'd put forth that effort for, done. He's on a heap on the pool deck, and his college coach comes up to him. And by the way, for those of you who have young kids and they're playing sports, Try as best you can to put them under a godly Christian coach. Because next to their parents, that person will have the greatest impact on their lives. Praise God that my son Michael swims under a godly Christian coach. And he came up to Michael when he's on the pile on the pool deck. His dreams shattered. His disappointment real. And he says, Michael, get up. Get up. You can't stay there. you got to get up. Michael gets up, and Coach Greg Rodebaugh puts his arm around him, starts walking with him, said, walk with me around the pool. And as they walk around the pool, Greg says words like these to my son, and I'll be forever indebted. Michael, the Lord must not have wanted you to go to Rio. If he'd wanted you to go to Rio, you'd go to Rio. But he must not have desired that. And I don't know what he's doing in all this, but he knows. you just got to trust him. you got to trust him. And slowly but surely, those words of hope gave my son back his equilibrium. It took him a while, but they came back. 
But here's what I want to share with you that's the rest of the story. As I share with you, Michael was very good friends with Ryan Lochte. They trained together. Two other of his close friends were Gunnar Bentz and Jack Conger. He swims against them in college. So Meryl and I are watching TV one evening, and we all of a sudden see the running line at the bottom of the screen. Ryan Lochte and three other swimmers arrested by the Brazilian police for falsifying reports and all kinds of crazy, strange behavior, all of them supposedly intoxicated. And I said, Marilyn, did you just see that? She said, mm-hmm. then the phone rings. It's Michael. Put him on speakerphone. Mom, Dad, are you seeing what's happening? Yep, sure do, son. What do you think of this? He paused for a second. He said, if I'd made the team, I'd have been there. He said, Dad, I know I would have been there. He said, I wouldn't have drunk because I don't do that. But he said, I would have been there. And Jack and Gunnar are good friends. I'd have been there. They'd invited me to go, and I would have gone. And then we both began to process what it would have been like for Michael Chadwick, who has a deep faith in Jesus Christ and is unashamed about sharing it, what he would have had to deal with with a press that would have loved to take in a good Christian kid and said he was drunk in the middle of the night, urinating in the back of a Brazilian filling station. And what it would have been like for him to fly back to Charlotte and get off the plane. Do you think the Charlotte Observer would have liked that story? And what they might have said about me and you, this church, defending ourselves? No, but he wasn't really drinking. And for the rest of his life, he would not have been remembered For a kid that won a gold medal, he would have been remembered as one of those out late at night, drunk with Ryan Lochte. So maybe, just maybe, the God who oversees history was protecting my son from something far worse. Maybe God understands what I've tried to teach you through the years, that rejection is God's protection Some of you girls who have had that awful guy treat you awfully and has left you, you should praise God for his departure. (laughs) Praise God that he's gone and not hurting you anymore. And that boss who fired you from that job, you at the moment go, oh no, but God's protecting you from something worse. He's got something even better for you. Rejection is God's protection. And Meryl and I thought, so what if we'd had a gold medal hung up in our living room every time we'd have walked by it? We'd have had a hurt in our heart for the ways that our child would have probably been wrongly caricatured. And I'm convinced of it, folks. My son has come out now on social media and said, the Lord's doing something in this I don't understand. And I trust him. And I trust him. And I believe that God is doing a gold medal work in his heart That's far more important than giving him a literal gold medal. That's what I think the Lord's doing. And I think he's doing the same thing with you. So so in your various trials, could you believe that the God of history knows the next step and he sees the next step? And what you think's the next step, it shouldn't be the next step. And God is protecting you from something that could really hurt you. And if you really, really believe that, what should happen in your heart? You should have hope. You should have hope that God's doing something with the gold of your faith, getting rid of all those impurities. Oh, by the way, for those of you who still have dreams, please know I'm not trying to shatter your dreams. You keep chasing after your dreams. You do that because I want to tell you something. My son now has come back with a fire in his belly, and he's going, Tokyo 2020, here I come. So you don't give up your dreams. Don't you give up your dreams. Don't you do that. Just trust God that he knows how he's guiding you. Okay. One more thought. Let me bring this airplane home and land it. The amazement of the angels in verse 12. Did you catch that? That that the angels look in to what God is doing in our hearts 
And in the words of Barry White, some of you may remember him a long time ago, I just can't get enough of that loving of that God. It's just so real and so deep. They just long to look into the ways God is redeeming his people, showing his love to his children. And the word that's used there, look in, is the same word that's used when Peter and John looked into the empty tomb. They stooped and looked into the empty tomb. And I couldn't help but think when I read that stooped and looking in idea, how many of you have been in a movie, and it's just a great movie, and the person inside of you, uh, in front of you, right, the most important part of the movie, gets up and decides to go get popcorn <laughs> or has to go to the bathroom, you know? And you're sitting there, as they're walking by, you're going, Ugh. that's what the angels are as they watch the ways God is loving people who are murderers and forgiving them. And the way God is loving people who are sexually using it in the wrong way. And as he's looking at people who have hurt other people wrongly, and and, and they're just probably poking each other with, they don't have elbows, with their wings, you know, and going, can you believe daddy loves him? Can, 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 can you believe daddy loves her after all she's done? And they just long, they love, they love God's stories of redemption in our hearts. Wow. And if you really believe the angels just love how God gives his love to broken people, that should give you what in your hearts? 